my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet, and they're made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. In the past, we've talked about the Luna breast pump and how much I love it on this podcast. And today we're going to focus on Motif's maternity compression garments. So stay tuned at the end of this episode for my chat with Rebecca all about maternity compression from Motif. Before we get to today's episode, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our listener supporters via Patreon. These are the people that are pledging $5 or more per month to support the podcast, and in return, they get special perks like access to all of our archived episodes. We're up to over 450 archived episodes, and we actually have a $1 level that just gets you access to those, so anybody can grab that membership as well. So when you join as a Patreon supporter, you get instant access to all of those birth stories that are no longer available to the public, and you get access to our private Facebook group, which is my favorite place on the internet. We have conversations about everything from, you know, trying to conceive to postpartum them to potty training and it's just so supportive i love it so much so if you want to find out more about that head over to patreon.com slash birth hour and you can see all the different levels of pledging your support there including our co-producer level which comes with access to our partner podcast that releases every friday where my husband is interviewing partners on their perspective of birth again that's patreon.com slash birth hour Today's birth story guest is Sarah. Sarah's going to be sharing her experience giving birth at a birth center. And Sarah's actually a professional marathon runner. So not only does she talk about running throughout her pregnancy, but I also really loved her perspective talking about the way people, society as a whole, really encourage you when you're training for something like a marathon, but maybe aren't so encouraging when you tell them that you want to have an unmedicated birth. I experienced this myself, and I actually just had a conversation with Rhea Dempsey, who is very active in the birth world. She recorded an expert interview with me for our Patreon listeners, and that's releasing this week. So it was really timely when I was listening to Sarah's episode doing the editing that I realized how many themes carried over with my conversation with Rhea. She talks about this crisis of confidence that so many people have today when preparing for birth and during labor and how a lot of that is a result of the way we talk about labor and birth in our society today. So Sarah really touched on that. I just thought it was a cool connection to that expert interview that I had with Rhea Dempsey, which was really seeing this week via Patreon. Like I just talked about with Patreon, you can get all that info at patreon.com slash birth hour. And we will also release a sneak peek of that expert interview on the main podcast feed. So you can keep an eye out for that as well. All right, that is enough for me. That's more talking than I usually do at the beginning of an episode. But I just really like that connection that I made just today when I was listening to both of those episodes. So I will turn it over to Sarah now and we'll hear her birth story. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Bryn. It is truly an honor to be with you today. Awesome. I'm excited to have you. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Sarah Crouch. I live with my husband, Michael, and our eight-month-old daughter, Charlotte, just a little bit north of Spokane, Washington. I am a professional athlete. I actually run marathons for a living. And uh, between my husband and I, we also coach a little bit over 100 runners all over the country. And we also co-founded a running vacation business for adults. And then in addition to all the running stuff, I am actually a certified birth doula. So our life is very, very busy to say the least, but uh, but we're enjoying it. Yeah, those definitely sound like challenging careers to have a baby doing as well <laughs> for so many reasons. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Throwing a baby into the mix has been, it's been a fun challenge for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start with finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy went. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my husband and I got married pretty young. We were in our early 20s and uh, we spent the next eight or nine years just training and and racing all over the world, really. We kind of got to scratch that travel itch that many young people have during our 20s. But by the time that 30 rolled around, I'd gone through a year of sort of really baffling injuries that kind of ground my running career to a halt. So Michael and I talked about it and I said, "This, this might be a good time to start our family. 
So that way I'm still sort of young enough to come back to the sport afterward if I want to. So we made the decision in January of 2020 that we wanted to go ahead and and start trying. And uh, the next week was when I ovulated and we happened to be leaving for vacation. So we were actually on the North Shore of Oahu, which is just, man, it's just golden sand, turquoise water, swaying palm trees, the whole nine yards. And I can't think of a, a more beautiful place on, on planet Earth to try to make a baby. And fortunately, we were lucky enough that, that we did get pregnant that week in Hawaii. So once you found out you were pregnant, how did you feel throughout the beginning of your pregnancy? You know, I kind of thought it could go either way. As a doula, I absolutely love walking alongside women in that pregnancy and childbirth journey. I find it fascinating. But as a runner, when I'm in peak racing shape, if there's an extra two pounds on me, I feel it. So I've been a runner for a lot longer than I've been a doula. And that side of me definitely won out. I hated (laughs) being pregnant for the most part. That whole first trimester, I was one of those people who is incredibly nauseous every single day, but I never really got that relief of throwing up. Mm -hmm. And so to sort of hold that nausea at bay, I would have to make sure that my stomach was never empty. So I would eat and eat and eat. And I I followed my cravings. So like buffalo chicken wings, corn dogs, Arby's roast beef sandwich, you name it, I stuffed it in my face. So I gained 30 pounds pretty much instantly, which was, (laughs) yeah, so that was, that was very sobering. But But by the time my second trimester rolled around, I did start to feel better and I I was fall into more of a routine. And every day I would go out first thing in the morning, I'd get my run done. And as I would run, I would listen to an episode of the birth hour. And I'd actually, back when I was doing my doula training, I had found the birth hour and I had just absolutely devoured it. I still maintain to this day, I think I learned more from the podcast than I did from my formal doula training. And I think there's just, I I mean, I mean it, there's just such a wealth of information in the oral passing down of birth stories from one woman to the next. Mm -hmm. But I will say listening to it pregnant was really, really different because every time I would get to the part where, you know, labor would start or contractions would pick up, I'd get those butterflies and I'd have that anticipation knowing that I was sort of on the precipice of that journey myself. And it's funny how you sort of remember like specific moments throughout your pregnancy. And for me, a couple of those are tied to the birth hour. Like I remember running up in, uh, I was on vacation in Jerome, Arizona, and I was running on these rocky mountain roads overlooking the city of Cottonwood, Arizona. And I was listening to Sarah Rainwater's birth podcast and she gave birth in Cottonwood. So as I was running, I was like, this is too cool that I'm looking over the city where she gave birth. And then Another time I was up in Flagstaff where I lived at the time and um, Flagstaff is at altitude. It's at 7,000 feet elevation. So it is hard to breathe normally. And then it's also hard to breathe being pregnant. So I was on a run. um, I was running up to about 9,000 feet and I was listening to Crystal Harris's podcast. And she is just so funny. She was describing contractions as crampy panties, like panties made out of cramps. And I was (laughs) laughing. I was laughing so hard that I had to stop running. Just (laughs) gasp for breath. So a lot of the moments in my pregnancy, I felt like truly, Bren, like you in the podcast were just my constant companion. It was like every day I would go out and make make a new mom friend. So just publicly, I want to thank you for, for the work that you do. I really, really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I think, you know, the real draw, especially being pregnant and listening, was that ultimately I was trying to wrap my mind around what is labor going to feel like. And And all the time, it seemed like women would describe contractions with just two different words. They would say pain or they would say intensity. And as I listened, I always wondered, okay, but what kind of pain? Like what kind of intensity? I was trying to sort of get a feel um, for what a contraction felt like. And only a couple of times on the podcast did I actually hear people describe what they felt like. One being crampy panties. And then (laughs) another another woman described a contraction. She said, it's like everything on my body wanted to be somewhere else. Yeah. Which again, was also really hard to, to wrap my mind around. But not until after birth did I actually realize, you know, I think the trouble with trying to describe labor is that like ultimately all we have is sort of these like limited Germanic syllables to explain something that's kind of indescribable. And if you know what a contraction feels like, it's it's because you've earned that knowledge. But that definitely was helpful as I went through labor to hear those stories. And, and you know, obviously getting pregnant in, in January of 2020 meant that by the time I hit my second trimester... The, the world had kind of flipped upside down with COVID, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And truly, I think that the biggest way that that affected me was, was in my work as a doula. Weirdly enough, it actually kind of made my job harder because as the hospital especially would start putting these restrictions in place, like they'd require masks all the way through labor or they would require 
a COVID shot when you walk in the door, or they would say, no, you're only allowed to have one other person in the room. So as they put more and more restrictions in place, we would have women during their prenatal visits say, okay, I now want to get to the the hospital as late as I possibly can. So sort of the onus for that decision of when to get someone to the hospital fell pretty heavily upon doulas. And the trouble is like, we're not checking cervix. So our ability to tell how far along you are in your labor is judged predominantly by what we're seeing externally, right? So our goal is to sort of get you to the hospital where you're far enough along that you don't show up at like three or four centimeters with, you know, more than half your labor to go, but not so far that you're having a baby in the car. So I feel like that definitely became a little bit harder as well as, you know, the emotional toll of leaving a pregnant laboring woman like in the hospital parking lot. That is difficult when you're emotionally invested in in someone's labor. So I have to admit, it was a bit of a relief to stop working births at about six months pregnant and to spend the rest of my pregnancy focusing on my own birth plan. Because even though I intended to give birth at the birth center, they weren't immune to the effects of COVID. And one at a time, it seemed like the things that I wanted in my own birth were sort of being crossed off the list. Like initially, I, I really wanted the chance to to birth in the tub. And they said, no, we're going to let you labor in the tub, but we'll have to pull you out when you start pushing. I'd also thought that I might want nitrous as an option. I wasn't totally married to the idea of using it, but I thought I'd like it as an option. And they decided right around that that June or July period that like, okay, we're no longer going to allow nitrous at the birth. So just one at a time, things were sort of getting crossed off, which I don't always, I look back on it now and I think it's maybe not a bad thing because birth does prepare you in many ways for being out of control of things on on your preference list. And then also as as parents, I think it's important to be comfortable with not being in control of every little thing. So I think in a way that can be really helpful, but nothing really totally prepared me for the last week of labor and how, or the last week of, of pregnancy and how how crazy that was. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing I wanted to say with choosing a birth center birth was that, and I've heard, Brent, I've heard you talk about this, like how when you chose to have a home birth, you did mention it to some people and you received like some pretty negative reactions, even from people who hadn't like done any sort of real research about it. They just kind of were against it to be against it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's pretty common with any sort of out of hospital birth situation. And when I shared, I was pretty vocal about it on social media. I did a post and I said, look, one of the reasons I'm running through my pregnancy is because I want to stay in touch with discomfort because I plan to have an unmedicated birth. And oddly enough, the responses I got to that were kind of shocking. I had so many comments. One woman said, oh, you know, be careful. That's what I wanted. And I ended up with a C-section. And then someone else said, well, you know, I had epidurals and I actually really enjoyed my birth. So maybe you should consider it. And I thought about just how crazy it would be if I posted, let's say a post about like a marathon I was running where I said, my goal is to win or to be the top American or to run a specific time. I don't think anyone would comment on it and say, well, be careful. I wanted to run fast and then I stepped off the curb and broke my ankle. Or, hey, if you slow down, maybe you'll enjoy it more. I just think it's really odd and kind of specific to birth that people feel the need to sort of superimpose their own feelings about it onto your own birth. And one thing I learned from you and other women on the podcast is just that you have to be fairly selective about what you let in. Because I did, I definitely received some backlash throughout my pregnancy. And and that kind of led all the way up to to my last week of pregnancy. And and I can go ahead and talk about that and get into the into the birth story if you're ready. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. So I will say that first of all, when I hit 39 weeks pregnant, I was absolutely shocked to still be pregnant. My mom, I know you hear that so often on the podcast that people are, they expect to go early. Yeah. (laughs) And I do hear that as a doula quite a bit too. My mom, she, in the most hillbilly labor story ever, she had been out riding the John Deere, mowing the yard, and she broke her water with me. So she went into labor at 35 and four. And so I figured, you know, I'll probably go early. All of her kids were early. My sister was early with her son. And so I figured that I would. So by the time I hit 39 weeks pregnant, I was really, really surprised that I was still pregnant. And then about halfway through that week, that's when prodromal labor started. So prodromal labor, otherwise known as false labor, is basically, it is contractions, but they're not the same as labor contractions. They're not productive. They're weird and uncomfortable, but I wouldn't call them overtly painful. And those started happening again about four days before my due date. Every night I would, I would lay down to try to go to bed and, and they would pick up. Even though I'm a doula and I know on a very like cognitive level, I know that this is probably not the real thing. I know that if I get up and move around, they go away. I know that they're not getting more intense. Despite the fact that I knew all that, the first time mom part of me was questioning it the whole time. Like, okay, was that one more painful? Is this it? You know, you just can't help but really sort of 
second guess what you're feeling. And so I would be up for just hours at night waiting to see if it was going to turn into real labor. So I was, I was really exhausted. And I had my final appointment with the midwives was two days before my due date. So I was two days into prodromal labor and two days before my due date. And I went in to have my last appointment. So I go in and, and, you know, the midwife who is there, she says, Oh, do you want me to, do you want me to check you? And I said, no, I'm not really concerned one way or the other. And she said, okay, that's fine. And the appointment was just totally routine. But then right before I left, I, I just mentioned something completely casually, sort of in passing. I said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. And then I told her about how when I had gone home to visit my parents in August, my mom had mentioned that after she had given birth to her twins, she had had a blood clot that almost killed her. And so she had had this clotting disorder and my sister had actually done an Ancestry.com kit and found out that she had the same gene, the same disorder. And so my mom had recommended to me, like, why don't you go ahead and do an Ancestry kit just to be safe? So I had sent a kit in and not really thought much more about it until that final week of my pregnancy when the results came back. And so at this appointment with the midwife, I did mention, oh yeah, by the way, my Ancestry.com kit came back and it turns out it looks like I do have the gene that carries this disorder. So it's it's likely that I have it. And she got very quiet and she sort of sat back in her chair and I said, what's wrong? And she goes, oh, sweetie, we're going to have to risk you out. <laughs> oh no. And again, like I'm two days into prodromal labor, yeah. two days before my, my due date. And those three words, risk you out, they just ricocheted around my head like a bullet. I was... I I started crying so hard that literally all I could do was leave. And I was crying so hard that as I left the room, I couldn't find the door to get out of the office. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so my husband had to like fumble around me and he got to the door and opened it. And I made it like five steps out, out onto the porch and I, I took my phone and I called my doula, Betsy. Now, Betsy, my doula, she... She is the reason I became a doula in the first place. Everyone everyone should have a Betsy in their life. She is just the most grounding presence. She's so steady, so calm. She's one of those people that just, she walks into a room and the room is a better place because she's there. That's who she is. So I called her and I said, Betsy, they're, they're going to risk me out. And so she, you know, she didn't freak out. She was like, okay, one step at a time here. Let's just breathe. Let's get you centered again. And then we're just gonna we're just gonna take this one step at a time. We're gonna figure it out. No matter what happens, you're gonna have a beautiful birth. So that night she actually had me call back into the birth center and I got a hold of Paula, who is the founder of the birth center. She's a wonderful midwife. And she told me, she said, Okay, if you come in tonight, if you go into labor tonight, I'm on call and I am comfortable with you giving birth here. So I will work with you if you go into labor tonight. However, I'm going to send you up to the hospital tomorrow and we're going to run a bunch of blood tests and uh, we're going to try and get the results expedited so we can sort of rule out this clotting disorder because ancestry isn't always super accurate. And I said, okay, great, whatever we have to do. So the next morning, I went up to the hospital after another night of prodromal labor I went up to the hospital and I spent $2,500 on blood work. And by the way, the results came back. I think Charlotte was two months old when I got the results back. Oh, geez. I know. So I didn't, it may have been backed up because of COVID, but it turns out I didn't even have that disorder, Bryn. So it was so frustrating. <sighs> yeah. So that next day was my due date. And uh, so I woke up that day and that was the only day in my entire second or third trimester that I, I didn't run. I woke up and I just thought I'm completely over it. I had called into the birth center and there was a different midwife named Karen on call that day. And she had said the same thing. Look, if you go into labor today, I'm good with it. You can go ahead and come in. So I was, I was relieved about that at least. And, uh, and that day, instead of running my husband and I, this is very embarrassing, but we, we have a huge affinity for disc golf. We love it. So we went out to, to play around and it was about two hours of walking. And on the course, there was this guy, I'll never forget this. There was a guy sitting on a rock And we walked past him and he looked at me and he just goes, oh, you're having your baby today. And it wasn't a question. He just kind of said it. And and I was just like kind of put off. And I said, okay, well, if you see me in a week and I'm still massively pregnant, you're going to eat your words. But he just seemed so sure. But sure enough, that afternoon was when contractions actually, actually started. And at first they didn't feel terribly different from the contractions I'd had during prodromal labor, but they started four minutes apart. It was, it was a lot earlier in the day. And by the way, they never really got any farther than four minutes apart. That's that's as far as they were apart for the whole 
the whole labor, but but right around 4 p.m. I called it. I said, okay, I'm I'm in labor. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and make it official. So I told my husband, I said, um, this this is it. This is the real thing. And of course, I'd been saying that for four days in a row. So he said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm I'm positive. I, I'm positive this is it. And he said, if you're sure, then I have something for you. So he left the room. And when he came back, he was holding this beautiful like wooden chest that had a big pink bow on it. And uh, he handed it to me. And um, I opened it and it was it was full of letters, these beautiful handwritten, amazing letters. And it turns out over the last couple months, he had been reaching out to the women in my life that I'm closest with, over a dozen women, and had them send in these amazing letters for me to read during labor. And and some of the, some of the women are mothers and some aren't. And all of the letters were so unique and different and just so full of strength and love and compassion. And, you know, there's like my sister, Shannon, she drew this picture of of Wonder Woman just soaring through the sky with this enormous pregnant belly. And then someone else had written a beautiful prayer for me to read. And somebody else had put in like this gorgeous poem. And so I was looking through these and I told Michael, I said, look, I want to sip these, not chug them. So let's, let's read one an hour. It'll sort of help us pass the time. And I figured I was probably in it for the long haul because my mom, her first labor had been 36 hours. So I figured it's probably, it's probably going to be a while. So, so that's how we passed the first several hours of labor was just just reading those one every hour. It was amazing. That's so sweet. I can just picture him too, like during prodroma labor being like, okay, do I give him to her now? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> so much uncertainty there. <laughs> no, that's so true. I didn't even think about that. And the thing is my husband, like he's not an overly romantic guy, but every now and then I'd say once every couple of years, he'll do something that just blows me out of the water in terms of my <laughs> expectations of him. So um, that was very sweet. I can say, yeah. honestly, I think that was the greatest gift I've, I've ever received. Hmm. So by the time eight o'clock rolled around, I told him, I said, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and, and get into bed and try to get some rest? I'm going to go ahead and fill up the tub and, and get in. And, and generally as a doula, like I don't recommend the tub too often during early labor because it can slow things down. It can sort of space contractions out and you generally want to encourage uh, progress early on. But In my case, the contractions were coming so quickly that I thought I could use a little bit of spacing out. I just kind of wanted to slow things down for a bit and and just grab a a breath between things. So so I climbed into the tub and weirdly enough, the tub had sort of the opposite effect. That was where the contractions went from manageable, from like breathing through them to, to me having to vocalize. And vocalization, it was for me throughout my labor, that was the number one coping technique that I used. It was kind of like the only way I can describe it is like if you put a tea kettle on, eventually the to break it down, it's like the heat from the Bunsen burners is going to agitate the molecules of water and they're going to produce steam. And eventually there will be too much steam for the vessel to hold. So it's going to escape through the hatch and make the pot whistle. So in my case, instead of steam, it was pain. And instead of whistling, it was like moaning or like groaning, I guess. It was just like I was literally opening my mouth and letting the pain out. And, and it was 100% involuntary. And I've certainly been with women who labor silently, but that is that was not my experience at all. So after about a half hour in the tub at 8.30, Michael, who was of course not sleeping through this, he came in the room and he was like, listen, I, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and call Betsy. It sounds like you need some help. And I hate that I thought this way because I absolutely hate when my clients think this way, but I thought like, ah, I don't know if I want to bother her. Like, what if this isn't the real thing? What if she comes over and then she has to go back home? Like, I'd hate to do that to her. But Michael, God bless him, he made the call himself. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to get her here. So, so we went ahead and called Betsy. And I think she showed up within the hour. And by that time, I was sort of out of the tub and in the bedroom. And I was draped over the birth ball. And I was looking at this picture on my phone that I had saved before labor. Some women really focus on verbal mantras, like the, you know a specific set of words or something they can say to bring them strength. But for me, there was a certain picture that I, I knew I wanted to look at during labor. It's this picture of this like old weathered lighthouse in the middle of the ocean. And it's being hit by a wave that is so colossal, it's like almost completely washing over the lighthouse. And I, I kind of wanted to look at that to remind myself like, okay, this is going to be the greatest physical storm that I've ever weathered, but I'm still going to be standing when it's over. So I was staring at that picture and um, draped over the ball and I had strung up these Christmas lights all around the room. They were the little ones, not the, not the white twinkly ones, but like the little colored ones. I'd always loved those since I was a kid. They're just so cozy. And 
they were putting off this really soft, like pink glow. And I had the diffuser going the whole nine yards. It was, it was really lovely. Um, and so that's where I was laboring when, when Betsy got there. And, and when she showed up, she just came right in, sat down beside me, told me I was amazing. <laughs> and she stuck a popsicle in my mouth and just did all the right things. I think she hooked me up to the TENS unit. And then she told Michael, why don't, why don't you take a little break? So he went downstairs and he put on a pot of coffee for them. And, and I think he put chicken strips in the oven. I smelled them from upstairs. <laughs> and I thought that was a really odd choice. But whatever, I guess he was, he was hungry. So so he had chicken strips in the oven and and he was kind of downstairs doing his thing as as Betsy helped me upstairs and and that's where I labored for the next couple of hours until around midnight and I was definitely still vocalizing through contractions they were still coming every few minutes they were lasting at least a minute and right around midnight the sounds that I was making during contractions they sort of started to shift I was still moaning through the first half of the contraction but then I'd reach the peak and instead of moaning I would make this sound that was kind of like it was like a stuttering sound like through the contraction. And so Betsy interpreted this as you're sounding a little bit grunty, like at the top of your contractions. And I think I would have probably read it the same way if, if I had been like attending my birth. And so she said, let's think about getting you over to the birth center. We might want to, we might want to get there. And so right around one in the morning, we, we called Karen, the midwife who was on call. And we said, look, we're going to drive over and we'll meet you there. So we put the exercise ball in the back of Betsy's car and I draped myself over it. And Michael followed us to the birth center in his car. And it's about a 10 minute drive to the birth center. And again, it was the middle of the night. So we're driving down route 66 and I'm in between contractions and this car just comes flying past us. And so I made a joke to Betsy. I said, Oh, don't worry. There's probably someone in their car who's in labor. And so she laughed and I realized it kind of dawned on me in that moment. I said, I shouldn't be able to make jokes right now. The fact that I was so lucid between contractions, I was completely myself. It kind of told the doula brain in me, like you might not be as far along as you think. But anyway, we got to the birth center and the birth center in Flagstaff, it's like this old dark purple house. It's kind of like a colonial style two-story house. It's beautiful. It has a fence outside and there's flowers painted on it and it's just lovely. So we show up there um, at about one in the morning and we beat Karen there by a few minutes. So we moved up to the porch and I, I again draped myself over the ball and we labored on the porch for a few minutes. And I remember it was cold. It was October up in the mountains and it was so clear and dark and Flagstaff is actually, it's known as the dark sky city because there's an observatory there where, where Pluto was discovered. So they go out of their way to sort of reduce light pollution at night. So it was so, so dark. And I was just laboring on the porch. And I, again, was, was, I was pretty loud. And so I, I said to Betsy, I said, I hope I'm not going to wake the neighbors. And Betsy, always saying the right thing at the right time, was like, listen, if, if they live next to the birth center, they're used to it. They know what they're in for. But anyway, Karen got there and she pulled around back and and I kind of saw her moving through the birth center up to the front door and she was turning on lamps as she went and she let us in and she put on a pot of tea and we got settled in the birth suite, which is just amazing. It's It's got a big bed and an enormous tub and it's got candles and diffusers and all of this art that's very focused on like feminine power and strength and 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 birth. It's it's just really really cool. It's a, it's the most amazing place I could think of to give birth. And so we settled in the room and and Karen told her assistant Brittany to check me. So Brittany came in the room and she checked me and I told her I said, "Listen Brittany, if I'm not a 6, if I'm anything less than a 6, don't tell me. I don't want to know." And she goes, "Okay, you got it." So she checks me and she removes her hand. And then she said very, she was very calculated in how she said it. She said, well, you're making progress. And I turned to Michael and very loudly, I said, that's not good. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, not knowing if you're less than a six isn't really actually that helpful. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> you have no idea how less than a six you're dealing with. That is exactly right. Because in my mind, I was thinking, oh no, what if I'm only at a four or a five and I'm not even halfway there? And not until the next day, Bryn, when I asked for my birth chart, I was at a freaking one. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was nine hours into my labor, but again, thank God they didn't tell me. And I always think about this. If I'd been at the hospital, well, I'm 99% sure I, that they would have been like, hey, go home, you're at a one. Yeah. And the way you run the math in your head when, when you're dilating, the way you think about it is you're like, okay, it's been nine hours. I've made it 10% of the way. I This is going to be a 90-hour labor, right? That's how you think of it. <laughs> 
But the thing is, and this is going to be a little bit of a spoiler, but I do want to just talk briefly about dilation and and timelines here because I think it could be helpful for someone listening, is that this is, so when I got my birth chart, I looked at this, it took me nine hours to go to a one. It took me four hours after that to go to a five. And then it took me an hour and change to go from five to 10. So if you're in the middle of labor and you're 10 hours in or God, 20 hours in, and you're at a one, don't think that that means you're only 10% of the way done as far as time goes, because that is definitely not the case. Yeah. Yeah. And there actually was, this really, really irritates me. There was a doctor way back in the day, I think his last name was Fleshman, and he put something in place called Fleshman's Curve. And he suggested that if you're not dilating exactly one centimeter per hour, then your labor needs to be augmented. And that makes me so angry because nothing was wrong with my body. That That's just the way that I dilated. Yeah. And people who have had more than one baby can definitely vouch for the fact that it all happens all over the place. <laughs> Absolutely. And especially with you, Bryn, because in, in your births, I know I've heard your birth stories. It's like <laughs> you've gone everything from like really, really long labor to like precipitous labor. So every labor yeah. is different, even even for, for someone who does it several times, you know? Yeah. So anyway, they didn't tell me and they didn't ask me to leave because they're wonderful. So so I stayed and uh, I decided I wanted to try the tub again. So I got in the tub and again, I just didn't like it. And so I decided, let's let's try the shower. So I moved into the shower and that is actually where I spent um, the next several hours of my labor. So I really passed most of my labor in that shower. And Betsy had told Michael, she said, why don't you get some rest? There wasn't a whole lot for him to do. So he went into the other birthing suite and laid down on the bed in there. But the problem is that the shower was on the other side of the wall. So every time that I would have a contraction, he would fall asleep for a few minutes and then he would wake up. He said it was like waking up into a nightmare over and over and over because he would like fall asleep and forget. And then he'd wake up and be like, oh, it's not over. So I think that was pretty, pretty traumatic for him as well. But, but as I was in the shower, I kind of rotated between two things. I really developed a ritual. There was a small wooden bench. And so between contractions, I would lean over this bench and I'd brace my arms on it. And I couldn't sit on the bench like that felt impossible. It was too painful. I just couldn't do it. So I had to brace myself. And even hours in when my arms were just shaking, I had to do that. That's the position I had to be in. And then when a contraction, I'd feel it kind of boil up and roll over me. I would stand up, I'd turn and I'd press my head into the corner of the shower. And I would just push as hard as I could as I let that pain out of my mouth. And that's how I coped during contractions. And Betsy, she was just sitting on the other side of the curtain on a birth ball, just kind of, you know, moving back and forth. And and between contractions, her little hand would just slip inside the curtain and she'd offer me a drink of water. And I think there there's a temptation as doulas to really to fill the silence in someone's labor. If there's moments um, of quiet, you feel like you need to be helping in some way, like you need to be saying something or doing something. But that night, I learned what it means to just hold space for somebody because that's exactly what Betsy did. She was just there. She was just there. And and truly, you know, a few hours into my stay at the birth center, by the time I was probably around five centimeters dilated, like there was nothing she could have said or done that would have made it better for me. I just needed her there. I just needed her presence because the contractions were really so strong. And I guess this would be the part <laughs> where I try to describe what a contraction felt like. But honestly, it's difficult for me to to use words other than pain or intensity. And I remember you saying once that you're like, oh, you know, eventually you just kind of forget. You kind of forget what a contraction feels like until you go into labor again. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is that kind of pain. And I thought you were nuts because I was like, I will never forget <laughs> this. But you do, yeah. you do, you totally forget. It's like you were saying, it's just so hard to explain and conceptualize mm-hmm. that like you can't really remember it. You just kind of remember how you felt during it, I think. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it, it's, I think your brain does that on purpose. But the one thing I can describe is how that pain is different than like the pain of racing a marathon because I've had so many people ask me like, okay, what's worse, birth or a marathon? Well, first of all, obviously birth is worse, but the difference is this, like when I'm racing a marathon, it's 26.2 miles. I'm not jogging. Like my pace is five minutes and 49 seconds a mile for 26 miles. Like it's an aggressive rhythm after about nine or 10 miles of that. It it does really hurt. And then by the time you hit like four or five miles to go, it's absolute agony. However, that kind of pain... 
I always describe it as like, it's this like muddy river that's running through your mind and you can feel like you're drowning in it, but ultimately you are the one who's controlling how fast that river is flowing, how wide it is, how deep it is. And if at any point it gets to be too much, you can kind of crawl up onto the bank and shrink that river down by, by backing off of your effort. You have the ability to do that. For me, the pain of labor, it was not like a muddy river. It's like I was sitting at the bottom of the deepest, darkest ocean of pain. I could not see the surface, and I thought, I'm going to die down here. It did not feel survivable. That's the only way I can describe it is like, it did not feel survivable. And if running helped me at all, it's that running over the last 15, 20 years has taught me how to keep a cool head in the midst of like physical chaos. So I will say the predominant emotion during my labor, it was not fear. It was not panic or anything like that. I was just astounded at the level of pain that I was in. I was just absolutely astounded that my body could reach those kind of levels of pain. So that's, I think that's really the only way I could, I could kind of describe it. At some point in the shower, I must have gone through transition. And the only way I can really identify it now is by the thoughts going through my head. Because I remember standing in there running the math. I kept thinking, okay, if they call an ambulance right now, here's how long it'll take to get here. Here's how long it'll take to get to the hospital. I know the anesthetist who's up there. He sucks. It's going to take him an hour just to get there. I'll have to fill out all the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was running the math of how long it would be until I could have the sweet relief of an epidural, which I will say this too. And God bless anyone who wants an epidural, I totally understand that there have been many, many times that I've worked births that I am so thankful for whoever invented an epidural. I think it's an amazing tool. However, if you truly, truly want to have an unmedicated birth and you're low risk and everything looks good, my best advice is to put yourself into a situation where an epidural is not convenient. Because in that moment in the birth center, I knew it would be hours. And I thought it's just not going to happen. And even at that point in time, so they had actually ordered this special uh, mouthpiece so that they would have nitrous available at the birth center. And I thought in my mind, well, I could use nitrous, but nitrous, in order for it to be effective, it requires that you take long, deep breaths during contractions. And for me, contractions were these short gasping breaths, and then all of my exhale would be those vocalizations. And I thought there is no way that I can take long breaths in right now. It just wasn't going to happen. So I didn't even ask for the nitrous. But yeah, at some point I went through transition and then I told Bessie, I said, I, I need to get out. Like, let's go over to the bed. So she helped me back into the bed and I immediately, immediately threw up. And at that point, after I puked, I looked around and I was like, get Michael. So she ran into the other room and she got my husband and, and together the two of them, they helped me into the tub. I decided I just kind of wanted to be somewhere different. It's not so much that I was so enamored with how the water felt, but I was just like, I just need to, I need to move. I think on some sort of subconscious level, I was sort of trying to move to like escape my body, but they helped me into the tub and I stayed in the tub for a while. And I, I remember looking at the window next to me and through the slits in the blinds, I saw the, the light turn from dark to like this really silvery gray light was starting to come in. And I realized, oh my gosh, like it's, it's daytime, like the sun is rising and I've been laboring all night. And you do sort of lose track of time as you're laboring, obviously. But it was right around that time that my contractions began to change. And the only way I can describe it is that all of the, the pain and, and the energy that had been swirling around me during contractions, all of that began to channel itself completely downward and outward. There really is no other term for it except bearing down. So it's like the beginning of a contraction would feel the same, but then halfway in, I'd take that breath and then all the rest of the energy would just go down, down, down. And my sounds began to change. And my husband described it as like if there was a lion in the Sahara, like guarding a kill from a pack of hyenas, like the way that the lion growls to guard his kill. He's like, that's the sound you were making. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> right. It was really very like feral. And it's funny because I actually have a video on my phone that Betsy took of me having a contraction in the tub. And it it hurt, it pains me to watch it because it's just so insane. It's just really one of the craziest, wildest things I've ever seen. So those those are the kind of contractions that I was having. And after four or five of them, it finally dawned on me that oh my gosh, I'm pushing. I'm pushing. That's what my body is doing. And so I decided to reach in to check my own cervix. So as I go to reach in, I didn't get to my cervix because I, I felt her head. And, and that was the first moment, as insane as this sounds, that was the actual first moment in the entire labor that I realized I'm actually going to do this. 
I'm actually going to birth her. She's going to come out. I'm going to do it here at the birth center. I'm not going to be transferred. I'm going to do it without drugs. All of that just came crashing down on me. And I said very coherently, I just looked at, at Betsy and I said, I can feel her head. And the odd thing is, and I see this a lot with people when they're pushing, is that during pushing contractions, it seems like the, the spaces in between, they do get a little bit longer and that you're, a little, you're able to be a little bit more present in the room because just a few minutes earlier, before those pushing contractions, Michael had been fanning me with a paper fan and I guess his arm got tired because he stopped and all I could manage to say, I was just like, <gasps> air. And he was like, what are you saying? I can't understand you. And Betsy was like, air, fanner, now. So that's all I could manage. But then all of a sudden I was able to say very coherently, like I can, I can feel her head, I'm pushing. And so Brittany and Karen came into the room. And I will say this about Karen, my midwife. She's fabulous. I've worked a birth with her where I saw her just sleep through like the craziest labor noises. She just, she is no nonsense. She's very laid back and she, she's been working births for like 26 years. She always shows up in like leopard print pants and cozy sweaters. She's just amazing. So she came into the room and she was like, well, sounds like you're pushing. So let's go ahead and get out of the tub. And I tried to negotiate with her. I was like, can I please have two more contractions in the tub? And she just looked at me and she's like, I'll give you one. So I had my last contraction, you know, in the tub. And again, it wasn't so much that I was really enjoying the feeling of the water as much as it was just that when you have a child in your vaginal canal, moving from one place to another just seems completely impossible. And yet I did with the help of Michael and Betsy, they helped me out and we went over to the bed and and I knelt down beside the bed into sort of like this half lunge, half squat position. And I tried to push in that position for a while, but the problem is, and I think this is really typical with people who are athletic or who are in a job that's really physical, that kind of feeling, because I will say pushing, it didn't feel good. I'm not going to say that it felt good. It was still horrible, but it was different in that it wasn't just pain. It was effort. And for me, effort is something that I understand. That's the kind of pain that I work with on a pretty regular basis. But for me, how I perceived that is like, okay, when you go through something like pushing and effort means that you contract your muscles, you tense everything. And so my glutes and hamstrings and pelvic floor, everything was just tensing even as I was trying to push. So my body was really just working against it. And so finally, Karen said, look, this is just not working. I know you don't really you know, want to be in this position, but we're going to go ahead and, and put you on the bed on your back. I think that's the way we can get your pelvic floor to loosen and we can get everything to open so you can get this baby out. So that's actually how I ended up pushing was was laying in the in the bed on my back. And um, probably the most amazing thing about birth centers are those big beds because Michael, there was room for Michael. And so I was kind of nestled into his shoulder as I pushed. And so his voice was just right in my ear. And he just kept saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. You're doing it. You're doing it. He was just so encouraging. And so I pushed that way and slowly but surely she started to, to move down. And then right about the time that, that I began to crown, she started having D cells like heart, heart decelerations. So when a baby's heart rate drops during pushing, that's totally normal. It happens. It happens in almost every birth I've been to. However, her tones were dropping long enough and low enough that they were wanting her out. And so Karen, again, very matter of fact, was like, okay, let's go. Let's get her out on this next contraction. And it was the only time during my labor that I said this, but I said, I can't. Because it was like Karen had handed me a drinking straw and a grapefruit and said, okay, it's time, push the grapefruit through the straw. I would have said, I can't, like this is physically impossible. And that's exactly how it felt. I thought there is no way this is going to happen. But Betsy, again, who always says the right thing at, at, at the right time, when I said I can't, she just looks at me and she goes, you have to. Just very matter of fact, tough love, basically like you're gonna push this baby out, so let's do it right now. And I, and I did. And I always described the moment right before she came out as the moment of unbelievable tension before an overinflated balloon pops. Like that's what it felt like. And my whole pregnancy, I'd been so afraid of tearing because every time I'd done perineal massage, I had always thought like, gosh, imagine the force it would take to actually tear these tissues. I thought that's insane. That must be the most painful thing a human being could endure is like tearing during childbirth. I was so afraid of that, but it just goes to show how crazy all of the other sensations that I was feeling were in that when I did tear, because I did, I didn't even feel it. I didn't even know what happened. Like that just goes to show um, how crazy everything else was feeling in that moment. But I did tear. However, she came flying out after that and they they passed her up to me and and she was just so she was so tiny and 
and warm and slippery. And I don't know why, but I just, I fixated on her nose, this, this tiny, perfect miniature version of a nose with its little teeny tiny nostrils. And it was so cute and so perfect. And I just kept saying her nose, look at her nose. And finally, when I tore my eyes away from her nose, I looked at my husband and Michael was just weeping. And Michael and I have been together 11 years and he cried when we got married, when his dad died and when our daughter was born, he doesn't cry. And he was just sobbing and he reached out and he took her hand and watching him become a father was, that was the most amazing moment um, of that whole day, maybe of my whole life. That to me was the best part is seeing him become a father. Um, it was just amazing. And and those next couple hours, we just laid in bed with her and Betsy heated up some lasagna and just fed me bites like I was a queen. And she told me I was a rock star. And you know, we spent the next couple hours just at the birth center getting checked out. And I did bleed a little bit more than they liked. So they gave me a shot of Pitocin in the leg. And that was not fun. Nobody ever talks about that. It felt like a little bee sting in the leg. At that point, I was just completely over pain. I would have taken an epidural at that point if they'd offered it to me. But yeah, but that was uh, that was the start of our parenthood journey. Oh, I love the way you described that. And I can definitely relate to the never cries <laughs> uh, husband. <laughs> and I remember Richard crying when I first was born. And like, I wasn't even crying because I was yeah, still so focused on getting the placenta out and like all the things that had to happen. But it's a sweet moment. Did you ever get any pictures of him like like crying in those moments? Because those are so special. We don't with with our first, but I do have some from the other two. But yeah, our cameras and photography and all that did not happen with the first. But yeah, those are... I like that too at weddings where the photographer like takes the picture of the guy while the <laughs> person is walking down the aisle. It's yes. So yeah, absolutely. Anyways. <laughs> all right. So how was postpartum for you? Well, I would say, unfortunately, very, very quickly... I sort of fell into a, a really, really dark period of, of postpartum depression. And I will say just right off the bat, like I, I leading up to birth, I, I'd had no experience at all with depression in my life. I'm generally a really, really happy person. I, I find joy and humor in just the simplest, stupidest things in life. But after giving birth, it was like that candle of joy inside me had just kind of been snuffed out. I don't really know why. I don't know that it had to do with the birth exactly, except that I had believed before the birth leading in, I had thought, okay, if I'm able to give birth without drugs, or if I'm able to get birth at the birth center without being transferred, or if I'm able to do X, Y, Z, then I'll feel empowered. I'll feel amazing. I'll feel beautiful. And the truth is, I didn't feel any of those things after my birth. I kind of felt like, like if a soldier had come home from war after like having survived an explosion, and because he survived, someone back in the States said to him, don't you feel so empowered? Um, I felt shell-shocked. I think that's the best word to describe it. I just felt shell-shocked. And for weeks, I, I didn't even want to think about my birth. I didn't want to talk about it. I couldn't even listen to the birth hour anymore. It was just really, really bad. And a couple weeks in, I ended up with mastitis, um, which you know is is an infection in one or both breasts because of breastfeeding. And, and it led to just days of, of fever and flu-like symptoms. And it was just so, I was in such a dark place anyway, because those first couple of weeks, I hardly ate. I had no appetite and I dropped 30 pounds almost immediately. And just, it seems like one thing after another just started to add into my postpartum experience. And I'd, I'd say probably the biggest factor was I had a really, really bad, I'm still dealing with it, postpartum insomnia. To the point that one week, I think it was my fifth or sixth week postpartum, I got to the end of the week and I, I wear a GPS watch that that I use for running, but it also tracks things like sleep. And it told me, it said, okay, this week you've been averaging two hours and 16 minutes a night of sleep. And I remember when I saw that, I was like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. But the problem is that when you go enough time without sleep, it leads to a sort of, at least in my case, the the only way I can describe it, it's a sort of like psychopathy. And there are studies that have been done that show if, if you are sleep deprived for long enough, your brain starts to fire in the same patterns as those of a schizophrenic. And for me, that was certainly the case. I began to experience really, really bad intrusive thoughts. Thank God I never had thoughts about like hurting Charlotte or, or I didn't even really want to like hurt myself, but I would have thoughts of like, there's an air, airport 10 miles away. And I thought if one of the airplanes just missed and like landed on the house, that would be okay. I had thoughts like that where I just sort of wanted to 
escape my life. And at that point, it, it started to turn from fall into winter. And, and Flagstaff is very cold um, during the winter. But at nighttime, after Charlotte would go down, I would just, you know, leave Michael with the monitor and I'd leave the house, even in like a t shirt. And it would be like 10 degrees outside. And I would just walk these slow loops on our block in our neighborhood. And And it's just like, I was just, I wanted to feel something. So what I felt was cold. (laughs) And I just sort of felt like that was my one time to sort of escape the the house and and my life. And after a while, I think maybe six or eight weeks is when I had my postpartum checkup at the birth center. And they do have you fill out that survey that says, it has you, you know, go through a number of questions from one to 10, like, okay, are you laughing as much as you normally do? Are you happy the way you normally are? Are you enjoying your day? And I remember sitting there and just circling zero, 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 zero. And so Karen, you know, she she suggested quite firmly, she said, I think you need to consider going on Zoloft. And and I refused. In my mind, what made sense to me at the time was I need to get back into running. I need to get back into my, my training. I need to get my fitness back because that will bring me my sanity back. And so I didn't want to use Zoloft on the chance that it might impact my training or how I felt running. And truly, I just... Unfortunately, I have this habit of just white knuckling the hard times in my life. And um, for me, it took around four months for the fog to clear. And it happened right about the time that I started losing all that hair. Like sometimes in postpartum, you just you reach a point where you just start pulling out like fistfuls of hair in the shower. And that's a signal that your body is returning hormonally to its pre-pregnancy state. And so that to me was what sort of all of a sudden it's like the fog cleared and I I I came back to myself, but that was not without a pretty severe mental and 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 physical toll because eventually the the mental toll took such a toll on my body that I ended up in the emergency room with with ulcers because of how stressed out I was which was it was it was pretty horrible <laughs> and so you know at 4 months when the fog did clear it's like all of a sudden I I wanted to be in my life again and and I would see Charlotte and I'd experience the kind of love that I wondered in my first couple of weeks, I thought, where is that kind of love that I'm supposed to feel? It's the kind of love that like, like my husband, Michael, like I would die for him. I believe that I would, but it would be a decision I'd have to make. With Charlotte, it would not be a decision. It would be an instinct. Like that kind of love finally, truly kicked in. Um, And I think that's one of the main reasons I wanted to come on and talk to you today is just that I wish, looking back now, I wish that when Karen had suggested Zoloft that I would have done it because I wasted too much time. And I know how easily someone could not be sitting on the other side of this conversation talking about it. And I just want to encourage like anyone who's listening who is going through that right now, or perhaps you're, you're pregnant and you have that particular journey ahead of you, please get the help that I didn't. If you're looking for a sign, this is it right now, my voice telling you to to go get that help, to go on medication and that when people ask you how how you're doing, that you're honest. Because when I was asked how I was doing, my answer would always be, oh, I'm, I'm doing better. But it was like someone who had an eating disorder saying, I'm doing better because they're eating 100 calories a day instead of 50. Like doing better does not mean you're doing well. So be honest and accept help. And that's that's the best advice I could possibly give for postpartum. Yeah, that's that's good advice. It sounds like you've really been able to kind of recognize the state that you were in when you made the decision that you did and and look back on it and maybe yeah. make a different one with future babies. That's very, very true. I think about that now and it's like, if I ever do choose to to grow our family or to have a second, I, I would accept that in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. I, I would not go down that path again, especially because now I know it's like, if Charlotte's old enough, like I don't want her to see me like that. That's not her mom. That's not who I am. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that part of your story as well. And if you don't have anything else to share from postpartum, I'd love to go ahead and ask you about resources that you recommend. The one that I didn't mention um, in what I sent you, and again, it's about postpartum because I think a lot of people prepare for birth. It's almost like preparing for um, a wedding without giving any thought to the fact that you have a marriage afterward. So I think a lot of us do spend a lot of time preparing for birth, which is maybe a day at most, or actually that's that's not true. I just worked a labor that was 105 hours. It was insane, <laughs> but but a few days at most. But truly, postpartum is such it's a, it's a much longer stretch of time. So in order to prepare for that, the resource that I would recommend most is a book called The Fourth Trimester. I know I've heard a couple women on the podcast mention it, but my best advice is don't wait until you are um, in your postpartum period to prepare for it. Go ahead and read that book while you're pregnant. And also because you're just going to have much less time to read once you have a baby, let's face it. Yep. (laughs) Very true. Prepare for the baby, not just the birth for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, where's the best place for people to reach out to you? 
Instagram would probably be best. I'm definitely open to talking to women, you know, about women who want to be active throughout their pregnancies, especially postpartum. I'm definitely more passionate about helping women through that. So Instagram would be the best place. My handle is at Sarah Crouch, S-A-R-A-H-C-R-O-U-C-H, 1989. You can find me there and, and yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing today. It was really great hearing your story. Oh, thank you, Bren. I appreciate it. Now I'm going to chat with Rebecca about Motif Medical's maternity compression garments. And don't forget to go to motifmedical.com slash birth hour for more information and to see if you qualify for a pump or maternity compression garments through your insurance. Hi, Rebecca. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about maternity compression and Motif Medical. I'm excited to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It's good to talk with you. Can you tell listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Rebecca Mustaleski. I am a CPM in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I do home deliveries all over East Tennessee. And with Motif Medical, I'm the maternity compression director. So I manage all of the blog posts and information um, researching for how compression can help with pregnancy and postpartum. Great. Well, I'm excited to talk about this today because I feel like maternity compression is not like super mainstream yet, but it's getting there. And I think you, you know about it once you need it and you get desperate, but it'd be great to find (laughs) out earlier. So what is maternity compression and, and what do we need to know about it? So maternity compression is a way of supporting the body during pregnancy um, to help moms and people stay more comfortable while they're growing a baby inside to help the body function more optimally while carrying the extra weight of a pregnancy and to help the person keep better posture, which is just good for overall body function too. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically a band that the person would wrap around their lower abdomen and hips to provide support for the weight of the pregnancy. And and that provides a lot of benefits for people. And you're right. A lot of people don't think about maternity compression until there's some sort of an ache or a pain that they're trying to fix. But the truth of it is that maternity compression can be helpful for pretty much every pregnant person. Um, Everybody is carrying extra weight. Their abdomen is doing, I mean, their abdominal muscles are doing additional work. Their back is helping or helping to compensate for that extra work. And so if more people would use maternity compression, I think that we would see a reduction in the amount of aches and pains during pregnancy because statistically about 71% of pregnant people end up saying that they have consistent chronic back pain throughout their pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. I think if we helped support the body more, um, as baby is growing and as the body is changing, that we could maybe bring that number down and help people be more comfortable while they're pregnant. Yeah. So on that note, is there a certain time during pregnancy that you would recommend starting or like signs to look out for to maybe start using these items? Yeah. So I would say sometime around 20 weeks. That's usually when a lot of people start noticing that there's a big change happening in their body, that the uterus has you know, grown up above the pelvic bones and is starting to fill more of their abdomen. And those, those core muscles just start doing a whole lot more work at that point in time. Um, and using maternity compression starting around 20 weeks would help those muscles from getting too overworked throughout the rest of the pregnancy. Um, so the goal of maternity compression is obviously not to take the place of your muscles, but just to support them because they're doing so much extra. When they start getting overworked, instead of the ultimate outcome being that the muscles get stronger, what actually happens is that they get weaker because they're just not able to keep up with the demand that's placed on them all day long. And so the muscles themselves get weaker over time and can't keep up with that demand. So if you provide that extra support from the outside, that compression to help hold the body in a better posture, a better position, um, and take some of the workload off of your muscles, that's going to be better for them and for your body in the long run. That makes sense. So I know there's so many different things like that you can find online and Motif has really put a lot of work into developing their compression, especially this pregnancy support band. I know it's an FDA um, listed medical device. So can you just talk a little bit about what makes their um, support band unique and maybe things to look out for when you're, when you're looking for this? 
Yeah. So one thing that I love about Motif's band is the time they put into researching and studying the best way to support where where the pressure points are that their band is giving support to pregnant people and where pregnant people actually need that support. So they've they've developed this product particularly for pregnant people and to give specific support in the areas that are going to benefit them the most. Um, and things to look for when you're looking for a support band. Um, one is that it's adjustable. Um, your body is going to change a lot throughout the end part of your pregnancy. And there may be days where you need just a little bit different support on different parts of your body. Um, and motif sand is great about that because it has adjustable straps that you can change for what you need throughout your pregnancy. And then just on any given day, you also want the fabric to be comfortable. Um, you don't want it to be creating any sort of like irritation to your skin or rashes or anything like that. So I think those are two of the biggest things to watch for. Okay, great. Yeah. And I love that they have a really helpful sizing chart on their site too, because I know it can be hard to know what to order maybe early on in pregnancy versus later, but they kind of offer both options to help you find a good, a good fit. And obviously being adjustable is helpful as well. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the other things that um, are available, especially in this category where things are often available through insurance. And that includes um, compression socks and the postpartum support. Um, Can you talk a little bit about those things? Yeah. So that is another thing about Motif that's great. These products are covered by insurance. So like I said before, I think it would be really helpful if more people use these compression devices, both in the pregnancy and in postpartum, because I think that's just a way of us helping support the work that our body is doing. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that can be really helpful in pregnancy, aside from the maternity compression band, is the compression socks. The socks really help support the circulatory system. While you're pregnant, your blood volume increases by about 50%. And because of where the uterus sits in your body, the blood flow that goes down to your legs and your feet is impaired. It's just doesn't work as well. Your heart has to work so much harder to get the blood to pump all the way down and all the way back, which is why a lot of pregnant people end up experiencing some swelling in their feet and lower calves. So what the compression socks do is they provide that support from the outside to keep the blood flowing down in those lower extremities and to keep swelling from accumulating down there. Because when the blood flow slows down, some of that fluid gets pushed into the extracellular space and it makes it even harder for that blood to keep flowing. So the compression socks keep that fluid from accumulating in the extracellular space, which allows the blood to keep flowing at a more normal pace. Um, And it's more comfortable for the women and to not have swollen feet and toes and ankles and all that. So it's good for the body and and then they feel more comfortable too. So that's a good thing. Um, And then the postpartum compression, I think, is great for everybody who's had a baby. So once you have a baby, um, there's a lot of extra space kind of in your abdomen where the baby had been taking up, and, and then it's not there. And all of your organs have to settle back in, and that's a really weird feeling to (laughs) feel, you know, like your intestines are settling back in, but there's just all this space and it just doesn't feel very comfortable. So the compression, one of the things it does is it, um, it kind of closes that space in a little bit more so that as things are settling down, it feels more comfortable. Um, and then the other thing that it does is your abdominal muscles have separated a little bit for baby to grow. That's a normal part of pregnancy. Everybody's going to have some abdominal muscle separation at the end of their pregnancy. Your body's made to do it and they'll come back together, but they're not back together right away. Most people, it takes eight ish weeks for those abdominal muscles to come back together. Um, and so you have this space in your abdomen that doesn't have Um, any sort of muscular support to it. And that external compression, when you start moving around and doing more things, can make that a whole lot more comfortable. Um, A lot of the parents that I work with, you know, around two weeks postpartum, they're kind of itching to get out and start going for walks and being a little bit more active, but their abdominal muscles really aren't quite ready for that. So this postpartum compression is a great way to allow them to do that without um, putting too much strain on their body that it's not ready for. 
Um, and it's also really great for moms who have had cesarean births. That incision site is really tender and delicate in those weeks postpartum. Um, it can hurt to even just cough or laugh. And, you know, nobody wants to not be able to laugh because you want to enjoy your life. So this compression provides a little additional support in their day-to-day activities while that incision is healing and while their abdominal muscles are coming back together too. Yeah. And I love that Motif has the different option for a cesarean birth versus a vaginal birth with the like side zipper yeah. so that you're not messing with your scar or anything like that when you're putting it on. Definitely. So helpful. One thing I do want to say about postpartum compression, there's a lot of postpartum bands out there. And one thing that I think is really great about Motif's product is that it incorporates not only the back and the abdomen, but it also incorporates your pelvic floor and support for Mm -hmm. your pelvic floor. So one thing I tell people postpartum is to kind of think about your core, which is your back and your abdomen and your pelvic floor as a tube of toothpaste. And if you were to just put pressure on the tube of toothpaste and you had the cap off, that toothpaste would kind of square everywhere. After you've had a baby, your pelvic floor is... If especially if you've had a vaginal birth, your pelvic floor has separated and relaxed to let baby come through. And it is not ready to hold that additional pressure that can be put by just having a band around your abdomen and back. Um, that can put too much pressure down on your pelvic floor that it's just not ready for. So um, I think it's important if you're going to have a postpartum compression garment that you make sure it supports not only your abs and your back, but also your pelvic floor. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's probably more comfortable too to have it be like one piece and not have anything like squishing down especially when you're you know sitting and nursing the baby and everything so right great well thank you so much for sharing about um all of those things with us and we'll we'll be sure to share all of the information to go find out you know whether your insurance covers it motif has a really great tool on their website to help you figure that out and help you get what you need so i really appreciate you coming on today and sharing all this information with us yeah thanks so much for having me Thank you so much again to Sarah for sharing her birth story with us and to Motif Medical for sponsoring this episode. You can go to motifmedical.com slash birth hour to see if you qualify for free maternity compression garments through insurance. You can also check out their Luna breast pump, which is my favorite breast pump. You get all that information again at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. And if you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Sarah's name in the search bar and you will find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.